While I was in D.C. for the Apollo 50th anniversary celebrations, I spent the day at Smithsonian Exhibits. Smithsonian Exhibits plans, designs, and builds exhibits for many of the Smithsonian museums and offices that create public-facing exhibitions. The director is Susan Addis, and I talked to her about her role overseeing this complex office. They must consider everything from the preservation of priceless artifacts inside cases they build, to the flow of visitor traffic through the exhibitions, to the installation of priceless objects and graphics on walls that are sometimes 100 years old. Uh, Susan, can you give me a broad overview of your job here? Sure. So I'm Director of Smithsonian Exhibits, and we are the in-house exhibit planning, design, and production facility office for the Smithsonian. So we work across the entire institution. We work with all the museums. We work with all the offices that create exhibitions. And there are lots of them that are beyond just museums. I mean, there's Smithsonian Gardens, libraries, archives, the Smithsonian Latino Center. I mean, there are probably 30 different groups that produce some kind of public-facing exhibit. And we work with all of them. That is a gigantic number of people. It's a lot of people. Um, the thing that I've been most surprised by is I've talked to the various departments here. I guess I'm not surprised by it, but I'm enriched by it is uh, how much collaboration there is across the whole process of conception to the execution of each of these exhibits. Some of them are only going up for weeks, some of them for years. Um, you are balancing so many different parameters to tell these stories. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about building an institution in which every department can feel so collaborative with every other. So you're asking how I do that? <laughs> yeah. Maybe just to comment upon it. <laughs> well, you know, it's, um, museum folk are very passionate people. And it's true at the Smithsonian. It's true in every museum I've encountered, including zoos and aquariums. I mm -hmm. put them in the same category. And when people care so much about what they're doing, while it can make the process sometimes a little adversarial, it's also very a very creative process. And people also know that they need to work together because there are so many disciplines that have to come together to put an exhibition together. You know, if the public could really understand what is behind even the simplest kind of exhibit display, I, I think that they would be impressed, you know, from the, the people that make the cases and what are those materials made out of and have the fire safety people check that out, have the conservation people checked out the fabric that's inside the case, you know, who has selected the object, who takes care of the object, where is it stored, uh, where is it going to be in the gallery, what are the environmental controls, I mean, the, it, it goes on and on and on beyond just the object, the label, you know, the physical structure that people see, and it's really those people behind the scenes that are what make this work so interesting because everyone has a different background. Everyone has come to museum work from a very different um, point of view. I, I don't think most people really grow up and think, I'm going to work in a museum unless they're maybe a paleontologist right. or they're an art historian. But most people really stumble upon museum work and then realize it's this whole world that's so interesting. Well, and I've, I've been noticing, again, talking to the various departments, uh, it's interesting and it's super creative and each of these people's point of view really matters within execute, making that final execution work. Well, it does, and it's about problem solving at every step of the way. And what I really appreciate about the people here is that everyone is a problem solver regardless of whether they're writing, they're figuring out a mount, they're figuring out the design. Every single piece of an exhibition is a problem that has to be solved. And everybody brings creativity to the process uh, all the time, every day. I'm curious about um, the metrics by which you uh, ascertain the success of, of, an ex of an exhibition. Do you guys do time-lapse cameras of people's engagement <laughs> with them or, or, or do surveys with visitors about how they engaged? Um, there are studies that are called um, timing and tracking studies, mm -hmm. which I've done. I used to work as an evaluator um, before I worked at the zoo. I did audience research. So I would follow people you know, with clipboards, and I would track where they go, where they stopped, right. who they talked to, literally timing them, how many seconds, you know, were they talking, were they pointing, were they 
what you know what were they looking at uh, so those kinds of things give you a very clear picture of how people are spending their time and using all the components of an exhibit but then you have to talk to them or at least talk to representative mm -hmm. people to find out what did people get what did they think what did they feel to see if the goals that you set out at the beginning of the process you actually accomplished at the end and ideally you also do testing along the way and the testing piece doesn't always happen. Uh, there's much more testing that happens with software and right, right. in other industries. And the museum industry is still trying to figure out how to work testing into our process, just because it's, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and it's an unknown. So right, when you're right. setting on a path to do a, a big complex exhibit, and you have all your design milestones and your fabrication milestones, how do you crack that process open to say, we're gonna pause right. and we're going to do prototypes of these five things and we're gonna test them because what if you find out that they're not working? Yeah. What does that then mean for these schedules that you've put in place where all these people, the conservators, the collection people, all these people that have been gearing their schedules to of the work they have to complete to this oh larger gosh. schedule, what if you have to throw all that up in the air and, and redo it and it's just too much for people yeah. to consider? So we are trying to build more a culture of experimentation, but it's it's a slow process. But we, we really have to because museum exhibitions are so expensive that if we're not testing things and making and refining them, then once it's done and it's out on the floor and it's not working, that's an expensive and time consuming. Right problem to fix. One of the things I saw that I really appreciated was a, a model of a giant squid's eye Oh yeah. that had been initiated by a docent who was right. formerly using a volleyball to make the size <laughs> comparison and paid to have the model making department give them the squid eye. I thought, That's right. what a lovely bit of, we can refine this and make this hit even deeper to the audience and teach even better. Well, it's also great that an educator is taking whatever resources he or she has to convey some Something complex to a visitor and so if all they had was a volleyball and it was about the size of a squid eye they use the volleyball exactly educators often have to be you know pretty scrappy people because education departments typically don't have the resources to make models so it's <laughs> great that this person found the money indeed what is the most difficult part of your job the most difficult part of my job is not super exciting. It really is making sure that I have the right amount of people, I have the right kind of people, so that whatever project gets lobbed over the wall to us that some museum or group wants to do, that we can do it. Uh, it just knowing how to keep the staffing at the right level so yeah. that we can deal with all the needs of the Smithsonian. And it's, given the people that I have met here today, it seems to me like you're also um, very much looking for people who uh, might be an expert in a specific thing, but also have a broad base of knowledge on a bunch of other subjects as well. Right. Now, they need to know a lot, and especially as technology increases, increases, and gets more complex, people have to know how to use the hand tools and also the software and the high-tech tools, and they need to want to adapt to those things. They want, they need to want to learn. So anyone who's working here needs to operate at a bunch of different levels. Well, and I see there doesn't seem to be any institutional fear right now of embracing some of these new technologies. I see all sorts of 3D printers and computer assisted stuff and interactivity. Um, it also strikes me, again, with all the people that I've spoken to, that there's buy-in on every level. Like everyone's interested in telling the story. Everyone feels like a stakeholder in, in getting that across the line to teach. Yes, I mean, we all take the Smithsonian mission really seriously. And even though we are not a museum ourselves and whatever we're producing will go into someone else's space, we all know that the end product is something that is going to affect a, a person, a group. And that is really meaningful to everyone. Uh, I mean, the Smithsonian's mission is the increase and diffusion of knowledge, and we all know that, and we take it really seriously. Yeah. I mean, it sounds sort of corny, but we do. It doesn't sound corny at all. Um, this is a, a, a palace of objects to, to help us understand ourselves and our universe. Uh, I'm curious if there is an object in here in, that you have intersected with that, that most moved you. I mean, you I mean at the Smithsonian? Yes. I'm curious, like, I'm curious about 
I'm never sure where where I'm going to find an object that changes the way I think about things. Mm. But I'm but you also have a unique position in which you get to kind of spend a lot of time getting to know these things. And I'm wondering if there's one that stands out. I don't know that it's one, but we did all of the object preparation for the African American History and Culture Museum, and so there are about 2,500. Objects in that museum, and we dealt with all of them except for the Tuskegee airplane and the segregated rail car because those are really big, yeah. and yeah. they were <laughs> they were already in the museum. But everything else we dealt with, we handled, and so all of those objects came through here. And honestly, seeing some of the slave materials up close, the shackles, the child-sized shackles. I mean, it was really the power of the object. And it was actually really difficult for the mount makers to work with some of those materials because they're real. And actually, it might have been there was a cat of nine tails that we exhibited. And, and the mount was beautiful because um, the, the whip end was sort of uh, splayed out mm -hmm. so that it was in action. Right. And very complicated mount. But I looked at that burnished handle, and yeah. I thought of the hands that held that. And then I looked at that, those whip ends and the flesh that that touched. Yeah. And it was, um, I mean, I still get very emotional when I think about it, yeah. but it really is the power of the object. And when museums wonder, what is our place in a digital world, it's object yeah. is our place in the digital world. Because those things are real, and they have stories to tell, and we just have to let them tell their story. So, I mean, I, I think that, that Cat of Nine Tails was probably the most um, impactful object I have encountered. Susan, thank you so much. This is, it's, it's, this is an amazing place to me, and it's even more amazing getting to peek a little bit behind the curtain. Well, I'm delighted that you guys all came. It's thank wonderful you. to have you. <laughs>